Let's go to the Lord in prayer again. Holy and almighty God, God the Father, full of grace, love, and truth, we come before you this morning with praise on our lips and thanksgiving in our hearts. We come to this worship to acknowledge our relationship with you as our creator. We pray that you would help us to fashion our lives in such a way that each day becomes a hymn of praise to you. To you, Jesus, God the Son, we again gratefully remember what you have done for us and how you brought us life through defeating death. We come before you humbled by your awesome power over the smallness of our humanity, over the vastness of this creation, over the waves, over the evil spirits, over physical impairment. Your miracles never cease. Yet we find ourselves in the beginnings of summer, of stepping into a different set of routines and somewhat selfish desires. We forget so easily what happens when we take our eyes off you. How the waves of life can so easily come crushing over us and we find ourselves scared and afraid. Call us to you, Lord, once again. Let us hear that pure voice of compassion and care intrude into our lives until we see clearly that it is you we need and what it is that you would have us do as Highlanders to be people following Jesus. And to you, God, the Holy Spirit, come to us this day. Walk beside us, even as we pray you have walked beside Connor James this day and every day of his life. Remind us that you make all things new. Call to our minds the words and works of Jesus. Remind us of his teaching. Remind in the forgetfulness of busy lives with opportunities to share the love of Jesus with others. To reach out as he would. To offer a word of healing, wholeness, encouragement. By your presence, Lord, show to us that we do not walk alone that we are not left to our own devices when it comes to discipleship. Breathe upon us, Holy Spirit, as you did at Pentecost. Cause a revival of spirit in each individual here as well as in our church. We'd also pray the same for our Presbyterian denomination, which is meeting as General Assembly in Oregon this week. Empower them to seek your wisdom in all decisions and empower us that we might be Christ to others sharing the good news even as you've given your life for us and for this church Lord we pray for others we intercede for them we have people in our hearts who we've been lifting up all week family members people in the hospital those anticipating surgery, those convalescing from surgery, those who are home, unable to get to this community of faith in person, but certainly in spirit. Lord, we extend our eyesight far beyond the walls to others, and especially though we would lift up Kenneth Smith, brother of Stephen and Sam, who was in an automobile accident and is recovering in the hospital, Lord, we ask your spirit to hover over that bed. Empower the healing gift that you've given to the doctors and nurses and caregivers. And hear us in this moment of silence as we would pray for others who are on our hearts. And then, Lord, hear us as we continue our prayers together as we raise our voices, being bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power. Thank you. 
If you will open your bulletin, you will see that the scripture passages are right there. They're short, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. You'll notice that the Old Testament is from the New Revised Standard Version, and the other is from the New International Version. The Old Testament lesson is at a very interesting time in Chronicles, which is a bit of a repetition from Kings, but in this chapter, there is almost a linear genealogy going around, which is, and right stuck in the middle is this historical significant point that is made about this person named Jabez. It's uh, two verses, we're only going to read one verse. Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, and that your right hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from hurt and harm. And then going to the New Testament, the Sermon on the Mount is actually three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So this is at the very end of that series of words which are considered the greatest sermon ever preached by Jesus. Just two verses, Jesus is speaking. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord God, we come to this day and at this time to lift up your word, to read your word, to meditate on your word, and to see how your word can find its place in our lives. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit would help us do just that. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Did you know that there are 6,800 languages in the world today? How many can you speak? No, I'm just... <laughs> the, the truth is that Americans are not very linguistic. We're big, we're broad, and part of what brought us together is language. And yet, what the experts are saying that by the end of the 21st century, over half of that 6,800 number will be gone. They'll be extinct. Languages die for a number of reasons, for war, genocide, disease, low birth rates, government policy, but globalization is probably posing the biggest threat of all. What do I mean by that? As the global village spreads and various economies become intertwined, many people who speak minority languages will stop using them. For very practical reasons, they will switch over to the majority of languages, like English and Chinese and Hindu, Urdu. And uh, you can see why they would do that. An example being in Australia, when the British colonized Australia, English became the major language of industry, economics, and commerce. And as a result, 138 of the 261 native tongues of Australia are extinct, or nearly extinct, almost half. So, back to the question. How many languages do you speak? I know several of you are at least bilingual. How many, how many claim to be bilingual? I know several of you are. Okay. Trilingual? Any, any trilingual? We have several of various languages, but you know, every one of you should have raised your hand when you said bilingual. Why? Because all of us should speak the prayer of language. Reverse that, the language of prayer. 
All of us should speak prayer as part of who we are. Sam and I were just talking about that this morning. Prayer as a very comfortable way to express ourselves to God. Imagine this conversation. Bill and Jack are greeting each other. Bill says, hi Jack, what have you been up to lately? Jack says, I just signed two big new contracts I've been working on for months and I won my flight in the golf championship at the club this weekend. How are you? Bill says, oh, I've been doing a lot of deep breathing and stretching lately. <laughs> my wife and I take early morning walks in the woods near our house. Plus, I'm taking a yoga class to help my meditation skills so I can spin up to an hour each day in prayer. Language of prayer. Definitely a minority conversation piece for us. Larry Davies claims that without you, O oh Lord, I can go nowhere. And if that's true, he says, prayer should be as critical and functional as the steering wheel on your car. Yet for most of us, prayer is actually more like the spare tire. We seldom use it unless we get a flat somewhere. Now, if we really believed in prayer, that God answers prayer, that prayer unleashes the power of God, then how often should you pray? That's a conversation we're having on Wednesday mornings as we study Islam. How many times does a Muslim pray each day? Five times. And we question, is that a legalism? Do you have to pray? When do you pray? What if you only pray four times? But it doesn't matter. How many times do we pray? George Barna's survey, and it's 15 years old, so I don't know what's changed, good or bad. I'm not sure here. But in 2001, he said 82% of adults said they pray at least once a week. 82%. 89% believe there is a God who watches over us and answers our prayers. 89%. Yet praying once a week hardly seems a strong endorsement of the power of prayer, don't you think? Perhaps it's a case of people just going through the motions, perhaps uh, racing through the Lord's Prayer as rote memory, which in effect regulates prayer to a minority language used by fewer and fewer people. Have we allowed the dominant languages of government, economy, commerce to take over our lives, edging out the lesser known speech patterns that can connect us in a life-giving way to God Almighty? Are we pushing the language of prayer to the verge of extinction? When you talk about the language of prayer with people, it's really interesting. Do you know that 95% of people, this is another old study, they don't do this study very often, 95% of people pray giving thanksgiving to God. Being thankful for something in their life, some blessing that they received. Obviously very appropriate for all of us to give thanks for the blessings we have. But only 60% ask God for something specific. But our text from Matthew said, ask, seek, knock. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Our single verse in the Old Testament is known as the prayer of Jabez, and it provides a wonderful, succinct formula for asking God as a form of prayer. Now, some of you, as I was, were first introduced to this, I think it was about 15 years ago, 10 years ago, that Bruce Wilkerson wrote that wonderful little devotional called The uh, Prayer of Jabez. It's a wonderful little study if you haven't read it. I'm sure it's in the library. But the first sentence of that book really caught my attention when I read it. And I still can remember it. It's like the first sentence of, uh, of uh, 40 
um, days of purpose, you know, it's not about you. That's the first sentence. Well, this first sentence is, what happens when ordinary Christians decide to reach out for an extraordinary life? That was his opening. When ordinary Christians reach out for extraordinary. 37 years ago, that's how I felt. I was entering seminary. I preached about this a couple of weeks ago about our receiving a call. And th after three years of classes, one of the professors at Princeton Seminary gave a challenge to the 126 graduates. And what he said was to reach for a life that would be more honorable for God. That would be our challenge. To reach for a life that would be more honorable for God. We were being challenged to make a difference for Christ, to seek something extraordinary, something miraculous, something blessed by God, energized by God, and used by God for others. Now, I still want that. That I might experience God in some special and miraculous way. That I might share the joy of something extraordinary. Don't you want that too? How do I get to this life of more honorable for God? To what I titled the blessed life. Well, it begins by asking God to bless you. And it begins right here in this little prayer of Jabez. L look at your bulletin, if you would again. So it's one sentence. Jabez called on the Lord of God, saying. That's a way of saying Jabez is praying. Okay, he's calling on God. He's having a conversation, a language with God. Look how it begins. There's a personal request there, isn't there? Oh, that you would bless me indeed. Now, asking God to bless you is not the self-centered act that it might appear. The definition of bless is to ask for or to impart supernatural favor. Well, another way to put that would be nothing more and nothing less than what God wants for us. But the very first step he's saying is you have to ask. That's just what we read in Matthew. Ask, and it will be given to you. Richard Foster, wonderful Quaker writer, many of you have studied him. He wrote in his book called Prayer. He describes God as the one who, and these are quotes, aches over our distance and preoccupation, mourns that we do not draw near to him, grieves that we have forgotten him. How could you not rush headlong into the arms of a God who loves you that much? The one who longs to commune with you that much. How can we realize that God is waiting daily to meet us, to speak to us, to hear us? Let's don't just rush past God making prayer a minority language. Just like we admitted in our prayer of confession that we said together a few minutes ago, let's pray daily, and let's pray often, and let's pray asking God to bless us. And then the prayer goes into kind of this spatial request. Oh, that you would enlarge my border. Now this is the most misunderstood part of the prayer. This is where you ask God to enlarge your life so that you can make a greater impact for God. Now in this version, it says, in this uh, prayer from the NIV, it says that you would expand my border. It can also be translated territory or coast. But what it means is that you would have more influence more responsibility, more opportunity. 
what you are saying is, Lord, give me more ministry. Make my life more honorable for you, O God. More ministry, more honorable for God means living out your faith for others. And then the prayer goes back to something personal and intimate. Oh, that your hand would be on me. The hand of the Lord is a biblical term. You can find it all through the Old Testament, particularly in Joshua 24 uh, 4 and Isaiah 59, where it's talking about God's power and presence in the life of His people. Now, in the New Testament, it takes a tangent because of Acts 1 with the Holy Spirit. And so, instead of the hand of the Lord, you hear the filling of the Holy Spirit. Same thing, the power and presence of God on your life. What this prayer is asking for is a spiritual transformation. When you call God's hand to be upon you, you're asking for the touch of greatness. But what you're praying for is that He becomes great through you. That others will see God reflecting through you. And then finally it ends with a very broad plea. Oh, that you would keep me from hurt and harm. Now others translate this as keep me from evil, or even keep me from pain. Now you've got to go back up to the Hebrew understanding that Jabez means pain. I bore you in pain is what his mother said and named him in that way. Glad, Connor, that you weren't named the same. Here you have this request that, you, that to be delivered from evil Sound familiar? We just said that, didn't we, in the Lord's Prayer? We, we, we just, every time we say the Lord's Prayer, we say, um, keep us from being tempted and deliver us from evil. Or the evil one, it can even say. This is a, a brilliant strategy to achieve the blessed life that if you continue to ask God to keep you from evil, from pain, from harm, from any kind of trouble like that, you are then more prepared to confront any spiritual or physical or bodily attack on you. If you go back to verse 9, which we didn't read, it starts out that Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. I don't think that means what the professor was telling me 34 years ago, that we would be more honorable for God. But what I do think is it gives us a challenge. And the challenge is to reach boldly for the extraordinary. Don't be satisfied with the same old, same old, the whatever, the, the mediocre, the average, the, the normal. God knows your gifts. God knows your hindrances. God knows your condition in every moment of your day. And God also knows something that it's impossible for you to know. God knows every single person who is desperately in need of receiving His touch through you. And at the end of this prayer, in verse 10, it says, And God granted His request. Just a short little verse. Just a short little tiny prayer. So I'm going to give you a, a challenge. That you take this and rip it off and put it in a place that's obvious to you, your wallet, your purse, your refrigerator, and that you pray this prayer every day this summer. However many times you want to pray a day. But you ask God. Ask, and it will be given to you. And God answered His prayer. Ask for yourself. You as an individual, to shine that light of Christ with others. To be that person following Jesus that others would see reflected in your life. 
But ask also for Highland. Ask the same that the blessing would come from Highland, that God would put His hand on Highland, that God would be such a part of Highland that it would be a majority language for us, not a minority language. And so why don't we close the message by saying together, for the first time this summer and not the last, this prayer of Jabez. So just like Jabez called on God of Israel, let us also pray together. Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, and that your right hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from hurt and harm. And all God's people said, Amen.